welcome to the Fox page, where we dive deep into the very best of books. We end up with a more complete and rich understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to lead, read a little bit better. I'm Kimberly Ford, best-selling author, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, editor and PhD in Spanish and French literature. And for any of you out there who don't traffic in rare books, Foxed Page might be something of a mystery. Foxing is just those little tan dots that you might see on the very old pages of very beloved books. And hey, if you want to, check out thefoxpage.com for features like Two Cents, where I predict in about five minutes whether you should or should not read a given book. There's also Booked, which are itineraries that suggest books that you might want to read before or during a certain vacation. We also have Memory Lane, where I take you on a little trip down Memory Lane, no rereading necessary, and I give you a 45-minute uh, deep dive into old favorites like Encyclopedia Brown or maybe even The Joy of Sex, that um, forbidden copy that you took down off of your parents' bookcases. But for today, we're diving into one of the most iconic and one of the most important essayists and novelists of the last century, Joan Didion, and we'll be looking at her White Album. So as always, the lecture today will be delivered in three parts, in sort of three half-hour chunks. Uh, today, we'll be discussing why read this book. We'll discuss a little bit about Didion's biography. And then we're gonna dive in to the title and to the first couple of paragraphs of, uh, of this collection to look at the amazing prose. In, I'm gonna do something a little bit different in the second section and in the third sections. We're, because it's an essay collection, we're gonna focus, we're gonna really um, you know, dive very deeply into the White Album, meaning the essay that is the titular album for this collection. So we're gonna, because the prose is so rich and because in lots of ways, I think the White Album as an essay uh, is emblematic of, of all of Joan Didion's nonfiction, I think it's a very good way to take a look at her prose in general while really focusing deeply uh, on, on one text at hand. And then um, if I finish up in the second one, I will move on in the third section to another very sort of seminal essay from Didion called In the Islands, but my suspicion is that I have so much to say in the first and second episodes that the second episode might spill over a bit into the third. Okay, so our intro, why read this collection? So um, uh, Didion is someone who has always been just an absolute icon, sort of a paragon of literature. She's also been a paragon of what it means to be a Californian, and then sort of became a paragon of what it means to be a New Yorker, which I think, um, you know, it, it, yes, call her elitist, and yes, call her, um, you know, narcissistic, and call her perhaps wrapped up in her own world. But California and New York are worlds that I very much love to explore, and they're worlds that I think she um, she she makes really, really, uh, I think, compelling and very sort of haunting visions of both of these places in ways that I think are really valuable and actually very wide reaching. So um, she, in some of the essays that I have read um, in preparation for today, she's been called synonymous with California and an icon of the early 70s. Um, it, it, you know, I think you can actually say that she has become an icon of much more, certainly the last half of the 20th century, and then became an, a sort of icon for grief um, and, and for memoir writing in the 2000s. Michiko Kakatani, at one point, the, the fabled and, and esteemed, highly esteemed New Yorker, um, sorry, not New Yorker, New York Times reviewer, she's a woman who could sort of make or break literary careers, at one point declared that California belongs to Didion. So those of you on the, um, on the YouTube channel can see that I'm, I'm actually physically in New Hampshire, but I am here in front of an image that to me says everything about Palm Springs, perhaps out in the desert there. Maybe not Los Angeles proper, but I think you could, you know, squint and imagine it's maybe Bel Air, except for those mountains in the background. <laughs> imagine that's Laurel Canyon in the background. Uh, not only is Didion an absolute icon and an absolute style maker in terms of prose, but she also became something of a fashion icon. So I would encourage you, again, if you're not already on the YouTube channel, to check out the images that I've curated very carefully uh, at the end of this lecture, sort of a supplement to the 90 minutes, where I have some incredible images of, of some of the people we're going to discuss today, uh, and, and certainly a few images of Joan herself. 
she was a real contradiction in lots of ways. She was a woman who was an incredible cook and an incredible entertainer and, and a real paragon of domesticity. She was always, you know, talking about sewing gingham curtains for the spare room and was absolutely the consummate hostess, but also was someone who, uh, you know, really wanted to travel to Vietnam to cover the Vietnam War, was not able to because they were quote unquote sending the guys. Uh, but she, she did in fact travel to El Salvador and did a lot of reporting uh, on, on some very difficult uh, political crises in different places in the world. So it, one of the questions is sort of why read this essay? And frankly, the part of the reason is because we read Slouching Towards Bethlehem already in uh, a different lecture. So there is so much incredible uh, Didion nonfiction that I think uh, it is well worth going back to the well, as it were, um, you know, just to use a, a water Met metaphor just because Didion is in fact, as, as I am also a fellow Californian, so invested in, in the importance of water and in its scarcity. So the White Album, I, I think is one of her darker collections. I mean, Slouching Towards Bethlehem is not, um, you know, it's not any bright optimistic thing, but I think it's actually, it, it's making sense in my mind right now on whatever it is, May 16th, 17th, something like that, 2003, to be um, you know, moving into a literary space that's even darker than Slouching Towards Bethlehem. I think it's timely to talk about uh, you know, a lot of the issues that she raises in these essays about the sort of end of the 70s and, and sort of this disillusionment after the kind of um, you know, the summer of love and after all of the freedoms that we began to explore as a nation in the 60s that you know she marks the end of the 60s on that august night when the manson family killed the people um up on cielo drive so th th there's this sort of sense of of a lot of optimism as being um eroded and, and and i mean not even eroded but just sort of violently eradicated by a number of things that happened actually in the month that i was born which is kind of wacky um, but there, but there is a sense of 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 um, you know things falling apart, which she began in uh, slouching towards Bethlehem. But we're continuing that feeling, so it feels very timely to be reading these like somewhat depressing. It's kind of like when you want to listen to Pink Floyd, The Wall in the car, like sometime when you it's like a Sufjan Stevens moment or something where you just need to really sink into some sort of darkness. And in fact. Um, I think she is uh, helping us to really sink into uh, darkness. So um, also, of course, we never read anything in these seminars that isn't absolutely incredible prose. And what I like about Didion is there are patterns that make her incredibly identifiable as a reader. Uh, and I'm going to pick apart some of these, uh, these patterns that she has. I wouldn't go so far as to say ticks but she has these, um, these sort of formula that she uses that are, that are really powerful and make for very powerful prose. So I think when we, um, when we dive deep into this one, maybe two essays, it will really give you a sense, if you haven't unpacked it already, of why Didion's prose is so incredibly haunting and powerful. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick bio about um, our Joan. She was born in 1934 in Sacramento and she died in 2001, right before Christmas. She died of Parkinson's. Uh, she was very much a, she was I think a sixth generation Californian. She wrote quite a bit about her uh, ancestors having come across um, the, the you know, she, some, one of her ancestors was in the Donner Party. Um, you know, they were people who came across the country to settle in California and, and they settled in, Cal in, uh, in Sacramento and, and really took advantage um, in some kind of gross ways of all that California had to offer in terms of, um, in terms of agriculture, in terms of real estate, uh, I don't have any like very clear data on what her family did, but she was a you know relatively wealthy sixth generation Californian. Um, she was also a pioneer in this idea of new journalism. So the new journalism was in the 60s and 70s. And instead of having journalism where the journalist, him or herself, was entirely uh, objective and really not seen at all, this, uh, this movement, this new journalism, inserted the, the, the sort of presence of the writer. So no longer did you have this kind of omniscient, um, you know, totally objective and, and also totally uh, invisible narrator. Instead, you have someone who is inserting their own circumstances and their own uh, reactions into the text itself. 
So often these pieces of new journalism also are built around a narrative. So it would be, you know, the story of um, Hunter S. Thompson, for example, is an example of this new journalism or Tom Wolfe. Um, you know, it'll be one of, it'll be a weekend spent somewhere and it's built around some sort of anecdote. So instead of just sort of your factual journalistic reporting, this became a much more personal way to draw people into the news. And I'm going to argue over the next 90 minutes that what one of the things Joan Didion does so artfully is to create a kind of bridge so that the narrator, especially female readers, um, so that the narrator can sort of draw the, the, the reader into a world that is totally foreign and may be completely startling or depressing or whatever the thing is. And, and, and yet she's able to create a bridge because she has made herself relatable. Um, she went to Berkeley, not to Stanford. She really wanted to go to Stanford as someone who um, has been rejected by Stanford three times um, and who is a graduate of Cal, um, at least for graduate school, go Bears. Um, I actually really take a lot of um, pride in the fact that she and I are both, uh, you know, uh, Berkeley graduates. And yet that was not happy for her. She was very, very sad about not getting into Stanford. At the end of her time at Berkeley, she won a Vogue contest. It was called the, the Prix de Paris, which just the, the Paris Prize, which is just so funny to me that New Yorker, I mean, that Vogue would have, you know, it's located in New York and would have this sort of Parisian air to it. She won that prize with what is a very um, sad sort of essay, which is not surprising, um, and moved to New York, was there actually for seven years. And she talks a lot about how being a magazine writer and writing captions, like having to, to distill a complicated idea into a caption was really good for her writing because it taught her economy and it taught her um, the way to be really pithy and concise. Um, so then um, she wrote a lot of essays then about California. She, would, she was um, working for the Saturday Evening Post and for Life Magazine and had these columns where she would write also the New York Review of Books and the New Yorker and the New York Times. She would write these kind of missives from whether she was in Hawaii or California. Um, it was sort of these like notes from California sort of pieces. She also, again, was highly political reported from Miami and Cuba and Salvador. She was one of the um, writers, the journalists, who sort of broke this um, the, the story of the Central Park Five and was sort of instrumental in terms of really uh, bringing to attention, to the attention of the public, the fact that these um, young boys were, were falsely accused. I hope I'm referring to the right terrible <laughs> accusations. I think so. She married um, John Gregory Dunn in 1964. They actually did a bunch of movies together. They did um, Panic in Needle Park and um, a couple of other ones that don't have titles that are quite that catchy that I cannot remember right now. Um, and they really um, were very, very close, although they had a very fraught marriage, which comes to the fore in this collection. Um, but they, they really had a, a very positive working relationship together. And they adopted one child, uh, Quintana Rue Dunn. And um, I think sort of famously at one point in, I believe 2003, uh, when their daughter was in a coma because she'd had this terrible flu and this terrible, it, it, I think that the details are a bit unclear, they're unclear to me, but I think they're also unclear uh, in general. Um, their, their daughter was in the hospital and her husband died of a heart attack and then her daughter died of a heart attack a few, I mean, of, um, of, of complications of pneumonia a few months later. So Joan Didion um, was absolutely just shaken, as you can imagine, by the, the, these two deaths, but then was able to write these incredible memoirs. And I think um, later in her life, she became very well known for, for just being able to sound the depths of, of sadness. I'm not really selling Joan Didion that well here because I keep talking about how depressing and how sad she is. Um, but but I think the prose is is so beautiful and so important in lots of ways. And it's not particularly uplifting. But again, I would argue that there are plenty of times, you know, when we need a little Pink Floyd and we need a little Sufjan Stevens or we need a little a little Joan Didion. OK, we're going to go ahead and dive in. I um, we're going to take a look at the cover of the book. So we have discussed time and again in these seminars, the importance of paying attention. 
So anyone who is here in order to learn to read, you know, a little better, which is a, a, a you know, a concept I, I sort of push against a little bit. Um, I don't think anyone needs to learn better, but of course we all want to get the most out of what we're up to. Um, this, the easiest thing you can do is to simply pay more attention. So we've also talked about the fact that that writers tend to have very little control over their covers of their of their books. Um, I don't know what Joan thinks about this one, but I do know for myself, I far prefer the edition that is simply white and then in kind of um, like not rainbow necessarily, but some colorful letters. It says the white album. So this is this to my um, you know to my eye is is kind of a weird hodgepodge. It's hard to see any of it. A couple of things I do like, though, is the fragmentation that we see here is actually very indicative of what we are going to find inside. So this is a, no a novel. I'm going to keep saying that through the 90 minutes. This is a collection of nonfiction that is very fragmented. And it's fragmented here on the cover. It's fragmented in every single essay. The collection itself, you know, not only each essay is fragmented, but, but, but the entire thing is fragmented. And all of that is highly intentional. Um, if Joan Didion is writing about fragmented times when entropy is sort of, you know, ripping things apart and 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 defying the logic of 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 all sorts of different things, um, it certainly makes sense that you would imitate that kind of fragmentation in the work itself. Um, I really like the title. We're going to discuss the title uh, in just a second. I love this photograph of her. Um, you know, she was known. Um, uh, she's a little bit of like an Anna Winter kind of a a, a gal. Um, here she's known for having these these uh, very large, glamorous sunglasses. There's a very famous advertisement of her when she's a much, much older woman uh, for Celine, which is in the, uh, this, the images that I'm going to show at the end of the lecture. But these very large sunglasses were um, not only a fashion statement for her, but I think were a very important piece of protection. She herself talks about being very shy and being very um, uncomfortable in social situations. But she also talks about how she's five feet tall um, and, and, and she, her stature, you know, she's a very tiny little person. And she talks a lot about her inability to, to chat and her inability to be social and her, her sort of reticence and her shyness uh, together with her small stature really allowed her access to a lot of journalistic venues that she wouldn't have been able to enter if she were someone who was, was more sort of conspicuous. So um, I also like the fact that a, a lot of these, um, the people that we see in the background here, um, that might be President Nixon, probably. Yes, because that's the era we're talking about um, in his very famous, you know, I don't know if that's when he was saying I'm not a crook, but you know, here he is. Um, but then we have these other people with the, um, with the bars over their eyes as if that is really um, obscuring their, I mean, these are probably very famous people that I cannot identify right now. So. Um, grab your copy and see if you can tell who these people are. But I like the kind of symmetry of, of her eyes being partially uh, occluded and then theirs as having those kind of um, those bars of anonymity. Okay, we're going to dive in. We're going to discuss the, the title in just a second. Uh, okay, actually, we're going to discuss the title right now. So um, the title comes from the 1968 Beatles album. It was their ninth album. And I actually didn't know much. I mean, I knew it came from the Beatles, but I didn't know very much about the White Album, the Beatles and uh, the Beatles album. She found that album, Didion did, she found it unsettling. Um, and it was in fact known um, itself, it's um, the, the makeup of the Beatles White Album is also very fragmentary. So um, it's the only double album that they made. There were 30 tracks on it, 30 songs. I think we can say songs when we're talking about an old um, record like that. Um, and, and it was marked by lots of uh, division and lots of fragmentation on the part of the band. Yoko Ono had come in and um, was causing all sorts of issues because they, you know, as a group, they had said no spouses or lovers or anything. So that was um, sort of pulling them apart at one point. Ringo left for two weeks, the producer left, uh, uh, the engineer quit. So it was a time of much fragmentation for the Beatles themselves. Uh, more importantly, um, it was cited by Charles Manson as one of the reasons, you know, one of his sort of motivations for some of the murders that the, the Manson family then went on to commit. Um, the aesthetics of it, the, the very stripped down white cover, um, if, you, if you don't know what it looks like, it's just a white background with an embossed black, the Beatles in a very sort of 
plain all caps uh, font. It's, it's very powerful actually, and especially after some of their frothier albums that had come, I think maybe Sgt. Pepper's came right before with all that kind of psychedelic, you know, pomp and circumstance. And I think the White Album, the sort of stripped down nature of it in 1968 spoke to a little bit of, of Didion's sense that, that all of the optimism of, of that decade of the 60s, all this kind of psychedelic fun and love was, uh, was coming to an end. Um, so it, it's also the title of the first essay. And this is sort of a, a, a um, you know, like a it's sort of typical to have your, uh, like to take the title of the one of one of your essays and have it be the title of the entire collection. And I think um, it, it's very well done because if you know anything about the Beatles album, which I think a lot of people do, I mean, I'm 53, but they're, you know, people of my generation and above for whom she would have been writing at that point uh, would have been very familiar with one of the most famous bands of all time and, and, and sort of the unease that, that was uh, together with that album. So there's, there's a, a, I think, a, an, an homage in this kind of weird sense to, to how difficult that was. Um, so again, it's also the title of that first essay, and that essay is 48 pages long. So it's it's a very long essay in the beginning. It's also very autobiographical. It's the it's the essay that we're going to dig into in parts two and three. Um, but I think it also is emblematic of of why uh, or emblematic of the collection as a whole, and also indicative of why she chose this as the name. So it's, it's an autobiographical essay, and it's very much about trying to put things in order, about trying to identify a narrative and being able to sort of create a clear narrative and, and, and sort of the difficulty of doing that, which again has everything to do with the entire collection. I'm not sure if you know the term fractal. A fractal is basically, um, it's like a small part of something that also reflects the whole. So. Um, for example, this essay is kind of a fractal of the entire thing. So the idea is that um, I don't I don't know if it's metaphysical. I don't know if it's chemistry. I don't know what it, I'm not sure where it comes from. I should know that. Um, to me, it sounds like light or physics or something. But the idea is that um, is that you can see in that one first essay, you can see everything that is also included in the larger essay. Um, she talks a lot in the first essay, too, about her psychological differences and, again, this fragmentation and violence. So it, it, it's very, um, it's a, I think, a very good encapsulation of what we're going to get in the uh, collection as a whole. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do in this first session is take a look on page 11 at the very first paragraph of the text. So... Um, this very first line is in fact so famous that it went on to be a um, the, the title of a different collection that she published much later. The White Album. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. So this idea of, of, of stories as being absolutely crucial is I think in this day and age, something that we all are very in touch with, you know, and this idea of kind of the post-truth narrative. I think she, she had, um, <laughs> She was very sort of prescient in lots of ways in understanding the importance of having narratives that were somewhat logical and at, at least were true. I mean, I think, you know, you can argue whether or not truth is possible in media, but certainly in this day and age, um, we have an entirely new uh, sense of the, the possibilities of untruths in media. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. The princess is caged in the consulate. The man with the candy will lead the children into the sea. The naked woman on the ledge outside the window on the 16th floor is a victim of Aksadi, or the naked woman is an exhibitionist, and it would be interesting to know the difference. So Aksadi um, is, a, is a very sort of um, esoteric uh, uh, Greek word that has to do with torpor or sort of apathy. So it's this question of, of, of is she going to be a suicide or is she an exhibitionist? Is this some kind of... Um, you know, is this a protest? Again, this is at the end of the 60s when you had a lot of protests, um, you know, people burning themselves in protest of the Vietnam War, that kind of protest, or whether this is someone um, who is simply caught up in a kind of um, very extreme apathy. It would be interesting to know which. We tell ourselves that it makes some difference whether the naked woman is about to commit a mortal sin or is about to register a political protest or is about to be, the Aristophanic view, 
snatched back into the human condition by the fireman in priest's clothing just visible in the window behind her. So I'm not going to pick apart the prose too much because we're going to be doing a lot of that in the next uh, in the next couple of of lectures or, or chunks of lecture. But it's important to note here the, the Aristophanic view. So Aristophanes was a was a Greek comedian. Um, it's funny to say that word because he's not like a stand up. He's not like Margaret Cho or something. But he 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 was a comedian in the sense that he wrote comedy. So in the old Greek sense, it was simply something that had a happy ending, but also was sort of the, the father of, of modern comedy in lots of different ways. So I think what she's getting at here, although it's a bit, uh, it's a bit esoteric, I think this idea of, of the fireman dressed as the priest, I, this Aristophanic view is sort of, um, uh, it, this might get kind of slapsticky, that there, this might be part of a comedy and we're going to have a happy ending and that there are disguises involved and that someone's going to snatch her back and we're all going to feel human again. Um, of course, the human condition is usually referring to the fact that we are all one day going to die and that is, you know, a very difficult reality and that it, you know, for many people creates a need for religion or a need for some sort of escape or some sort of philosophy to understand the magnitude of the human condition. So I'm not sure Joan is actually promoting some kind of like Keystone Cops thing here. I don't even know what the Keystone Cops are, but um, you know, we've got this fireman priest here. Uh, also this mortal sin idea, um, you know, she, John Gregory Dunn was like a very devout Catholic. I think she herself is Episcopalian and like like very sort of like almost Protestant and almost very waspy. Um, but but she also I think really uh, was intrigued by Catholicism, which was very important to her husband. So of course suicide is a mortal sin. So I think there is this sense of um, uh, you know of this woman truly running some risk here. But the whole point of this beginning of the paragraph is that we really don't know. There's no way for us to know um, what what is happening here. Uh, let's see. We look for the sermon in the suicide, for the social or moral lesson in the murder of five. She's referring there to the Manson murders. We interpret what we see, select the most workable of the multiple choices. Here we're talking about education, we're talking about order, we're talking about, you know, passing tests. We live entirely, especially if we're writers, by the imposition of a narrative line upon disparate images by the ideas with which we have learned to freeze the shifting phantasmagoria, which is our actual experience. So, I mean, what an incredible phantasmagoria. I mean, if you can work that word into the first um, paragraph of your, of your essay collection, and in fact, if you can end the first paragraph with a sentence that includes that, I mean, it's to freeze the shifting phantasmagoria of our actual experience, is just, it's such a powerful, um, literally just such a powerful uh, string of syllables, but also this, this idea which controls the entire collection, that, that what her job is, is to make us feel better because she's going to impose some kind of order. She's going to look for a moral lesson or she's going to explain something to us. She's going to reveal something that's going to make us feel like the human condition is, is somehow surmountable or that um, reality is logical or that there is a divine um, you know, presence that is going to control things for us. So, spoiler, as you have already guessed, uh, I don't think Joan is actually, uh, if you if you sneak a peek at the very next sentence, which I'm going to unpack in part two, you'll see, in fact, that our Joan doesn't actually put that much faith in the idea that she can do this. She is simply saying that that is the job of the writer. So to unpack that next sentence and to learn more about the genius of Joan Didion uh, and the, the particular genius of the White Album, check out segments two and three of our um our discussion of the white album so tune in and happy reading